Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to be talking about the concept of a Gravastar. We're going to try to understand what it actually is or what it means, why we've defined this such a concept, and even if we've actually been able to detect any of these Gravastars in the last few years. Anyway, welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So let's start from scratch. What exactly is a Gravastar? By sort of unofficial definition, Gravastar would have practically the same elements and the same um, properties as a black hole with some very, very, sim uh, very, very small exceptions. So I'm going to place a black hole here right next to it and it's about the same size as the Gravastar that I had. And um, in Universe Sandbox, they do look and appear quite different, but in reality, they might actually appear and be quite the same. So, a few years ago, when we've discovered that black holes had this unusual effect of information paradox, basically, uh, if matter falls into a black hole, it kind of just disappears and its quantum information is lost forever. And this sort of created uh, created a paradox where you can't really have information just disappear into nowhere. You should be able to retrieve it even after the object is gone. And um, Gravastars kind of solved that problem. And the person that came up with this idea, actually two people that came up with this idea, were uh, Pavel Mazur and Emil Motola. And they created this as an alternative to black holes. They actually defined Gravastars as super, super, super dense, super dark, super cold stars that collapsed on themselves, but didn't really have a kind of a singularity inside as a black hole. In other words, there was no like, you know, division by zero. Nothing created infinity. What was inside um, a Gravastar was basically, okay, you can't really see it here, but it was basically a, uh, a kind of a empty uh, space inside, it's essentially vacuum. And this vacuum was defined as a gravitational vacuum of a star. Therefore, they started calling this gra Gravastar. And uh, this gravitational vacuum was uh, super, super, super tiny. It was only the size of a Planck length. Basically the smallest possible size of any object in the universe. And around this object, right around the, uh, the, the vacuum, lay what's known as um, this unusual type of, or not type of, but state of matter known as uh, Bose-Einstein matter. This is something that you can actually create in a lab. It's if you cool the gas to like super, super cold, almost zero degrees uh, Kelvin, basically almost to absolute zero, and the gas starts behaving very, very differently. So they think that around this vacuum, uh, this gas is kind of forming this kind of a sphere. And then around that, you'll have other materials. And all of this behaves with rules from quantum mechanics. Uh, so all of these limits are actually quite well defined and understandable, unlike in black holes where we actually have no idea what's going on in them. And so uh, this is sort of a re redefinition of the idea of a black hole, but with discrete length, discrete uh, time quanta known as chronon. And uh, all of these concepts are, are now known to exist, but back then when we just uh, uh, conceptualized black holes, it didn't really exist. And so in reality, Gravastar is a kind of a modern version of the black hole, but using quantum mechanics. And then there is another main difference between two objects, and you can kind of see them if you just sort of do this, right? Black holes have what's known as a event horizon. So a light uh, cannot escape from a black hole. There's a region where we cannot see into. And so this is sort of what black holes are known for and Gravastars don't have uh, don't have the same kind of a black hole event horizon, but they have their own quantum uh, limit. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a limit uh, inside where the light approaches this uh, Gravastar and starts getting blue shifted more and more, and its frequency increases until it reaches the length of a Planck length. And after that, you can't really see it anymore. So, in other words, it's kind of similar to Event Horizon, but it's a very interesting quantum effect. 
So if the uh, frequency, or if, I guess, if the actual light wavelength increases to the point where it's below the maximum limit, which is the Planck length, it sort of disappears and cannot uh, be seen anymore. And so right inside of this, it kind of creates this unusual effect of uh, unmeasurability to the outside world. And so this region is actually called gravitational vacuum. And because of this void um, in, in sort of space and time, you cannot really observe the inside. And from the outside perspective, you cannot see into it. Now, just to make this a little bit more clear, let's, let's see if we can maybe recreate this. So we're going to create this void by using a very, very small black hole on the inside. This is going to represent the void. And around this void, we're going to place uh, this, this region of space uh, that you can't see into. And so here is that vacuum void on the inside. And on the, on the outside is this unobservable region. So right after this part, the light becomes uh, too hard to see or basically impossible to see because the wavelength is too short. It's basically shorter than you can observe in the universe. And then it possibly just kind of is still there, but we just can't see it anymore. Now, right outside of this region is this unusual matter known as Bose-Einstein matter. And this is a, not exactly the matter itself, but the state of matter, similar to how we have states like uh, ice, uh, liquid, gas. And this one is actually a very dense form of matter known as uh, Bose-Einstein uh, condensate. So we're going to place it around here as well. We're going to add it just for visualization. And we're going to make it a little bit of a different color. Maybe I'll just make it... Uh, yellow or something and this is potentially what it may look like so there there is our uh both uh, both einstein cond condensate and there is that region after which you can't really see anything but to the outside observer the core of the black hole would actually appear as this uh, condensate it would basically be still visible and so basically one way of testing if we are observing a black hole or a gravistar is to look inside and to see what we actually see and if we are able to find this uh, type of matter state in or very close to the core of an object, we might actually be looking at a gravistar, not at a black hole. So the outer core of a gravistar would appear to be a Bose-Einstein condensate. And also because the light that's kind of coming out of here is uh, highly redshifted due to the gravity, uh, it would actually make the core appear very, very cold, almost absolute zero. So it actually appears a very, very cold, super, super cold condensate, which is why it actually forms here, because it needs to have these super cold conditions. Uh, and externally, so far, this would appear as a black hole, but it would have no event horizon. It just would have similar effects to event horizon. And it would uh, only be visible by high energy radiation it emits by consuming matter. So if any matter falls into it, so if we actually launch something into it, it would kind of do some uh, somewhat similar things to uh, an actual black hole. So let's just launch this here. Try to launch this asteroid into, into it. And uh, we're going to unpause the game just to see if... Oh boy, yeah, things are going a little bit too crazy right now. It's too fast. Uh, so, this asteroid will maybe take forever to get there because I decelerated uh, time here. But basically, by the time it gets into this black hole, it's going to release a lot of a lot of energy. And we can detect this energy very similar to how we would detect uh, the effects of a black hole. So. In, in some sense, so far, there's really no difference between a gravistar and a black hole. And in some sense, this is why this is an alternative theory to black holes. So the people that propose this, they actually think there might not even be black holes. Maybe gravistars are a better explanation because it sort of removes this information paradox from the equation. Uh, but at the same time, maybe there is actually both. So some people suggest that maybe there's both. But on top of all of this, uh, the scientists that kind of invented this concept, so Mazur and Motola, also proposed that uh, gravistars might even be responsible for the violent uh, origins of our universe. In other words, the Big Bang and many other universes as well. So what they're suggestion is suggesting is that because the matter goes inside of this uh, gravistar, 
uh, and because the matter uh, that was around the Grava Star previously kind of implodes through this one single point in the middle, it might actually explode into a completely new dimension, and this explosion would uh, be equivalent to a Big Bang. In other words, they suggest that maybe an explosion from a Grava Star created our own universe as well. And this would actually be consistent with cur current theories regarding the Big Bang, and this new dimension uh, would obviously exert a lot of uh, various pressure on the uh, uh, condensate that's around it, so this yellow thing right here, and uh, prevent it from basically collapsing even further. In other words, the universe on the inside of this Gravastar would prevent uh, this object, this whole Gravastar with its condensates, from disappearing into nothingness. So it's kind of holding it all together, creating this balance. But if all of this wasn't enough, there's actually another uh, unusual mystery that Gravastars might solve. And this mystery is in regards to dark energy. As a matter of fact, they actually would kind of unofficially explain why the universe is accelerating, if it is accelerating. Uh, currently, we think it's because of dark energy, but one possible hypothesis um, proposes that we actually can explain all of this by a kind of an exchange of Hawking radiation. Now, I've talked about Hawking radiation in one of the previous black hole videos, but here, um, the exchange between the uh, parent universe, which would be in this case, uh, this universe, and the child universe, which is inside the Grava star, could potentially accelerate the expansion and thus sort of explain how this dark energy effect is observed. But all of this is still very speculative. It just kind of combines a lot of these unusual theories we have into one and tries to explain it through quantum mechanics. So just to summarize, basically the idea of a grass star takes a lot of uh, new physics that we've discovered in the last few decades and uh, creates this hypothesis of this object known as Gravastar to try to resolve uh, various theories we have in regards to black holes and various theories we have in regards to our own universe. And they do kind of make sense, but obviously they also uh, kind of destroy the idea of black hole. So they replace black holes with these unusual objects known as Gravastars. But there are obviously a lot of differences between Gravastars and black holes, and one of them is actually uh, the event horizon is not uh, one, okay, not the event horizon, but this this uh, limit right here is n But there are actually some major differences between Gravastars and black holes, and one of them is actually uh, that, you know, black holes have event horizon that's very specific, whereas for Gravastars, this limit right here would depend on the wavelength, and it would actually be expanding from here to maybe somewhere over here, depending on the light that goes in there. So some light uh, reaches Planck length much faster because of being blue shifted. Other light might take much longer. So the reality would actually look somewhat uh, similar to this. So here we're actually going to place other colors just to kind of represent them in here as well. And they're, they're not really inside of each other, they're just outside of each other. But uh, let's place, so we have green, we have blue, and let's place red as well. Uh, so these are the visual colors and they're, they're possible, um, they're possible limits of existence inside the, or close to inside of Gravastar. So here, I think this should be enough. We have three different, uh, slightly different in terms of uh, actual location. I guess you could call them event horizons, but they're not event horizons. Three different limits for existence of different uh, frequencies of light. And so the closest one is the blue light, then it's a green light, then it's the red light. And they disappear uh, in different locations around it because their wavelength, when they start approaching the grouse star, are different. And so here you can kind of see it even easier. They're sort of right above each other. And there's obviously a lot more, including things like infrared light and X-rays and so on, and gamma rays, they're sort of closer to the inside. Um, and one last thing I wanted to mention is that um, a few years ago, specifically for me, it was back in 2016, I think, uh, so just under, or just over a year ago, uh, we've detected a collision between two intermediate-sized black holes, but the scientists that actually pro are proponents of this hypothesis suggested that maybe we didn't actually see two black holes collide, but maybe we actually saw Gravastars collide with each other. And here's actually another Gravastar approaching 
uh, this grouse star and they're going to collide into one another. And the reason why they think so is because of the observations of frequencies that they saw. So um, everything up to the actual collision should be the same, but right after the collision, a black hole would uh, kind of exert slightly different gravitational waves and the grass star would, would do something else. Now, I'm not going to go into specifics, but the scientists that observed these effects believe that it might have actually been a gravity star, not a black hole. Uh, there's still not enough proof, and we need to see more of these collisions before we can speculate even more, but uh, there is some talk about those two collisions being two gravity stars instead of being black holes. So, in some sense, we may have actually detected them, but still far from saying for certain. So that's kind of what we know about Gravastar so far. This is the idea, this is the basics. And hopefully in the next few years we'll discover more and know more about them. For now, that's that's about it. That's all I know, that's all you know too right now. And in the future, maybe we'll know more. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this video with someone who enjoys watching things about space, sciences, and maybe even math. And most importantly, if you know more about Gravity Stars that I haven't mentioned here, and this is the future, post it in the comments below so we can make a new video. See you guys tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye. And maybe if I accelerate time, we'll actually finally get to see that collision from the asteroid that I launched a long time ago. Oh no, it's moving the wrong way. It's moving away from the Gravity Star. Maybe I need to slow it down to make it go inside. Because I accidentally launched it in the opposite direction. And while I'm waiting for the uh, asteroid to approach the inside of a grass star, you can kind of see that some of this Bose condensate is actually escaping because of the interaction with the central region. So maybe, just maybe, this is kind of how we could one day even see it. Escaping uh, unusual matter from inside this unusual vacuum void. So here comes that collision. Three, two, one. And this will be the source of a tremendous energy that will be released as X-rays. Well, maybe next time. No energy was released this time. At least none we saw.